Well, good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Good to see you this morning. Good to see some faces back from last week. Uh, welcome to the college students. Um, we are in desperate need of the Lord this morning. So uh, glad you could join us. If you would uh, pray with me, and then we're going to see a video that our children's ministry leaders have put together. And uh, then Wes will come up and and uh, welcome us to give us some announcements. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for this time we have together. Um, you're a good God. Lord, we love you so much. We're glad to be here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Before the club begins each Sunday, we will prepare the classroom for the kids. We have a large area with ample room to create appropriate social distance between each family group. The classroom and chairs will be carefully disinfected before and after each use. The worksheets and or craft materials for each lesson will be placed in the pockets of the chairs to maintain social distance throughout the lesson. When the club begins on Sunday, each child will sign in and have their temperature checked. Kids can begin signing in at 925. We appreciate your support by keeping your child home if they have had a fever in the past 48 hours or are not feeling well. All volunteers will be using masks throughout the entire club time. Hand sanitizing stations are set up at the entrances for your convenience. Masks for kids are optional. After your child is signed in, they will be directed to their seating area and the fun will begin. Restrooms will be available and disinfected between uses during the lesson time. If your child has an urgent need during the service, volunteers will send you a text for you to come to the activities building. When the service is over, we ask that you come directly to the activities building to pick up your child. After dismissal, the area will be thoroughly cleaned and ready for next time. For those of you who choose to view the lesson from home, our tech team will upload each lesson to our YouTube channel following the Sunday service. We hope you feel just a little bit safer bringing your kids to church on Sunday morning. We look forward to ministering and being a part of their lives each and every Sunday. Thank you for letting us partner with you and your children. See you in a while. Excited about that, Eli the Elk. You making a? Is Eli the Elk making a special uh, appearance next Sunday? You just never know. Y'all come and be part of that. Uh, for the folks who are. Needing to watch that online, it is available, and it'll be, uh, all the lessons will be available for you there, as it always is, but we're excited. It starts during the service next Sunday in both services, 
the English-speaking one as well as the Spanish-speaking one. So uh, I do want to welcome all the guests and visitors and the folks who might not have had a chance yet to connect with us. It's real easy to do. I've been told that, that it's so easy even I can do it. All you got to do is click on either English or Spanish service buttons on the home page. So if you can find the home page, you'll be all right. Other than that, it won't be any problem. We'd love to know who you are to connect with you, to pray for you. It's a ministry we have here at the church. I also want to say, uh, uh, if you would prefer, you can contact the church cell number at 254-485-4441. And this is all in lieu of the connection cards we normally use because we haven't been handing those out recently. I also want to say welcome to Mike and Tammy Riggs. They're not here. I don't see them anywhere, but I know they're here, right? They're going to be here in the next service. It's good to see them. Uh, I hear there were some tough things going on where they were at. Uh, they've been serving near, what's, what's the name of the, the town, the area they were serving at? Lake Charles, near Lake Charles. And that was pretty hard hit. Uh, I hear that their trailer had a lot of damage. Is that right? Uh, yeah, totaled. They just got it set up came back and told us we got everything set up and the next day it's gone so I want to pray for them and connect with them while they're here uh, he's gonna have a one-minute update sometime soon maybe or just in the Spanish service well you tell him you got to come back okay Miguel mm -hmm. there you go uh, I've also got a note to read to you from the Heinz family uh, they were folks we supported with their work in Asia and they've sent this note to it uh, Elkridge Church, our family has felt so supported and included over the past several months of being in Stephenville. It's been such a joy for us to have been part of your body in person rather than from afar or even to see you on the screen. We pray that as you continue to grow that dad would bless all of, the, uh, all of your efforts in loving and serving in the local community and through the numerous support and wor field workers you have. Elkridge truly is a special place to so many. With love, the Hines family. So uh, they have made a move to Houston to finish up their time here in the States before they head uh, to their next adventure. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? We've got a meeting today at 1030, right after this service in the activities building. Mo, what's that for? It's for feedback regarding the prayer outreach that we had, not this past Tuesday, but the one right before that. All right, so if you were part of that and, had, and would like to meet, uh, catch us at 1030 right after the service in the activities building. I also want to remind you that we're continuing to spotlight Alex and Cameron King our field workers uh, currently they're serving uh, here in the states while they're waiting for their opportunities to get back overseas uh, but if you'd pray for them and continue to connect with them mo what are they doing and where are they at say that again the kings what are they doing and they, where are they at yeah the kings they are in phoenix and dallas they are working with refugee ministry and they are partnered with an organization called go 10 and so they've just been asking the Lord to continue to give them fruitful work while they're stateside, and that's what the Lord has provided for them. So we're grateful for that, and we ask you to continue to support them and pray for them. Uh, also for Adam and Anna Lee, uh, they have moved in with their father in Nevada. Uh, pray for them, pray that there's a local church for them to connect with, and that they would uh, continue to, to heal after this time, after Jose's passing. Uh, also want to remind you again, uh, speaking of the rigs earlier, serving the Lake Charles area, we want to pray for all those affected by the hurricane. And wanted to remind you that not only have they served there, but Daniel served there uh, in that area for 14 years. We want to pray for our brothers and sisters there and, and be available for any help. I have two other prayer requests that were given to me this week. I have two friends of mine. Um, both have been diagno diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, one young man, Jared, he is 26. Mm -hmm. He's 26, and uh, we were told this week that it's stage four. Uh, ask you guys to keep praying for him. Jared Veldhuizen, uh, been a longtime friend of our children's. And then also another friend of mine since high school, Les Grace, his wife Penny was diagnosed with lung cancer recently, and she started treatments, and he's asked if we'll put her on our prayer list as well. So pray, continue to pray for them and all the other ministries and things the Lord lays on your heart. And we ready to continue in worship? Yes, sir. This is a good time. Y'all stand up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and continue in this time of worship. Let's pray. So, fathers, we think of uh, the Riggs family, and we're grateful for them and the connection and the joy they are to our body, uh, their children, their grandchildren who serve here with us. Lord, we pray that you'd bless them and make great provision 
to replace the things that they need as they, as they move back into the Lake Charles area. I thank you for the ministry that they have there and for the things that you've called them to in Peru and amongst people who speak uh, Spanish as their heart language and now for a time amongst the people of Louisiana. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters and those who have been displaced or lost life, lost possessions, lost homes who are struggling because of this hurricane. Lord, would you just do something fantastic to show yourself strong and mighty in those communities, I pray. And if there's something we can do as a body, would you make us aware of it and bring it to us so that we may, we may love our neighbors well. Lord, I pray for Alex and Cameron King, our field workers who've served in Asia for many years and who are currently serving here in the States. Lord, as they do a work with their agency, would you bless them? Would you help them continue to grow in that? And that from that may new things happen. Lord, I pray for a quick return home. I want to give thanks again for the Joneses who've returned home. And I want to pray and remember the Shawls last week who asked us to continue to pray if they would be able to return home to Thailand soon. Lord, I pray for my friends who are struggling with cancer. For Penny, would you um, cause the treatments to work perfectly? And now with it at an initial stage three, would you cause it to shrink and, and bring health and life there, for, I pray. Lord, for Jared, we thank you for his life, for the testimony of his goodness, for the influence he's been on our family and the joy he is to his family and his, his daughter, his wife. Lord, we pray for a miraculous touch that you'd heal him and make him well. God, we ask that all the things that we're a part of not be blessed because we're a part of it, but th that we are a part of it because it's your plan and your provision for us and, and the things you've called us to. And as we quickly point people to Jesus, you would bring life and freedom and joy in all these places. I pray for my brothers and sisters here, for the folks of this community. Lord, that you do a great work, I ask in Jesus' name.
your son to save us from our sin empowering us with our with your spirit to live this life you've called us to live you are good you are great and we worship you this morning in jesus name amen you can be seated Well, good morning to you. I really do look forward to the day soon when we'll be all back together. We don't have to talk about two services anymore, and it's good to, to see many of you um, back from the summer, and we have some guests this morning. We're glad you're here, especially this morning. You know, we were singing about God's greatness, and uh, interesting, too, that we were singing about it's His breath in our lungs, and that just seemed to be very timely with what Wes had said, and I just think, find it so timely that the Lord brings things together like he does. I'm reading Psalm 104 yesterday, and it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, you're very great, very great. goes on, if you want to read about God's greatness, you can have some fun in Psalm 104 this week like I intend to. I think I'll spend the whole week just digging around in there at least. Read through it last night and just amazed. Just reminded again how powerful God is, how little I can do and how much he can do. So let's pray. Father, I want to take the, uh, the words of the psalmist to heart. And I want to instruct my soul this morning to bless you. To praise you, to worship you, to talk about all the things that you do for me. And I am thankful for the way you've taken care of me, my family, my church family. I could list a ton of things. I suppose we all could. And that's the point. That we'll bless you with thanksgiving. And you are very great. And we are grateful to be able to gather together and worship you this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I am a rules guy. Always have been. I'm pretty submissive to authority, even if I don't always like what I'm being asked to do, or in some cases being told to do. But I've always been pretty submissive. Tell me to drive 55 miles an hour, and guess what? That's pretty much what I do. I drive 55, even if the other guys are flying by me. Here I am. Tell me that uh, I have to wear a mask in HEB, and, you know, I'm, they ask me, and it's required, so I'll do it. I'll, I'll wear my mask in HEB. Tell me, um, back when I was a college student, you can't have a hot plate in your dorm room, so I, I won't sneak one in. You know, I'll... I'll do what's asked of me. I've always tried to keep rules, and I was taught well as a, as a child by my church family, by my mom, and I've always tried to keep rules, not just for the sake of keeping rules, but to do what's asked of me for one reason, and that is to bring glory to God. I can still remember sitting around a dorm room many years ago back in college, and we were discussing whether or not it it made sense if you were driving out in West Texas and you came to a four-way stop 
sign intersection and you could see for miles in every direction should you just go ahead and blaze through it or should you stop and we decided in that conversation in our dorm room that night you should stop why for the glory of God so even then I was reinforced with that in the school that I attended and good godly young men that went to school with me honoring the Lord bringing glory to him is our utmost purpose right now Many Jews in Bible days, and even in modern days, they're pretty good at keeping rules, too. When their rabbis teach them that each morning when they put on their shoes, they should put on their right shoe first, then their left shoe, and then they should tie the left shoe before going back and tying the right shoe as part of the laws of pleasing God. You know what they do? They do it. And when the rabbis tell them, when it's time to cut your fingernails, you should cut this one and then skip to the middle one and then to the pinky. You should never cut two consecutive fingernails or toenails in succession. You know what they do? They obey and they do what their rabbis say. They, they keep the rules. When told that it's generally forbidden to ask a non-Jew to do what they are not as Jews permitted to do on the Sabbath day, they generally honored that by the rabbis. But if you're ever invited into a Jewish home on the Sabbath day and it's a bit hot in their apartment and they have forgotten to turn on their wall unit, which they're not permitted to do on the Sabbath day, and they drop the hint that they apologize that it's a little hot in there, volunteer and go turn on their AC unit for them, and they'll greatly appreciate that. So there are rules when you are following the traditions of the rabbis. They made rules, and they make rules still, that teach their people that if you Abide by these rules, you are righteous, even though they are not part of the Bible. So, to me it's sad that to them rules keeping seems to be more important than honoring the heart of God and knowing God and understanding God's mercy. They're stuck keeping the traditions of men and the rules that they themselves have made. And so many of them, and so many of us, if we can bring it back on us, we follow rules, but we forget about sometimes the simple truth of the gospel. We forget about God's grace. Now we're in week 12 of 15 of our series that I've entitled Jesus by the Lake. You could be making your way as, as I am as I'm trying to find my way over from Psalm 104 now to Matthew 12. We are observing Jesus by the lake, by the Sea of Galilee. He's teaching, he's transforming lives along that northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And today we're in Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. The Pharisees began to oppose Jesus. You may remember that day when there was a crowd gathered in the home where Jesus was and four men with a friend or a brother, whoever he might have been, they couldn't get in, so they climbed the stairs, pulled the roof off, and let him down. Remember the story? That's when the opposition to Jesus really began in earnest in this part of the country. But opposition from the Pharisees intensified greatly, began to really increase when they observed who Jesus was associating with. He was associating with can I even say it out loud? Tax collectors and sinners. Not righteous men like them. And that really began to bother them. And then now, the opposition to Jesus is coming to a head. Pun intended. Watch for it late, later. But their opposition to Jesus is coming to a head because Jesus won't honor their traditions, even though, again, their traditions are man-made. They are not part of God's Word. Now, it's 
in particular, a couple of things that they're going to be upset about. One is the issue of fasting, and the other is the issue of the Sabbath day. And both of them are good. Jesus, he initiated fasting, and he initiated the Sabbath day. Those are biblical concepts. Those are expressions of his heart as he wants them to understand that there is a day that should be set aside for remembrance and rest and, and worship. And so fasting and the Sabbath day were intended for that, for just that. But the Pharisees, they do what they have always done. They add requirements that are intended to explain the nuances of what the Bible says. And in adding these nuances, they end up creating burdens, more and more and more things that people must do, in their opinion, to prove that, that they are being true and righteous in obedience to the Word of God. That's why when you look, you found your way now to Matthew 12. If you look back at just a couple verses before that, it's those famous verses where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are burdened. And I'll give you rest. Rest from all of the requirements and man-made rules of the Pharisees. So here we are in Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. And let's read through and I'll stop us as we go along. I want you to understand what I've learned. And I'm glad to be able to share with you. And maybe one day you can sit down and share with me things you've learned from Matthew 12. I'd enjoy that as well. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, which, of course, we know is Saturday for the Jews, their day of rest, where they don't work. And his disciples, Jesus' disciples, were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. Now, if you go back to Deuteronomy, and you could, you could go back there with me, or I can just read it for you. In Deuteronomy chapter 23 and 24 and 25, they talk a little bit about this, what we're, we're about to see unfold before us. What do you do in a grain field if you're hungry? And it says, actually, Deuteronomy 23, 24, when you come into your neighbor's vineyard, it will start off here, when you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes at your pleasure, but you shall not put any or collect any in your container. That's different. It goes on, it says, when you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. So evidently, it's okay. It's acceptable to pluck the grain, when you are hungry. Verse 2, But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. I suppose they wouldn't have had any other trouble with any other day of the week, but the sticker here is, the Sabbath day. Now, two things here. First, as far as I can tell, um, this, this is the first time that the Pharisees have come at Jesus. You go back and look at the stories. They're always confronting his disciples and kind of on the side, like, Psst, come here. But now, they march right up to Jesus and confront him. They are getting bolder. Now, second, and here's where I have to kind of go, all right, Wait a minute, because I'd have to give the Pharisees here at least three Pinocchios for what they say here. Because uh, if you go back and you read in the law, Exodus chapter 34 and 21 here, and again, I'm, I've got it here in my notes for you. The law of Moses doesn't read as the Pharisees claim that it reads. What it says is this. It says, six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest time you shall rest. So, yes, you are not permitted to work, to harvest grain on the Sabbath day. 
but could plucking a head of grain when you are hungry as you are journeying down the road be considered work? Well, yes, if you're a Pharisee. Plucking a few heads of grain for them clearly was work. And that was not permitted. But they are taking the law of Moses farther than it was intended. It did not say what they claim it says. And that's a good charge to us, isn't it? To be very careful. that We do not go beyond what the word of God says. Perhaps the three best words you could use in any discussion or conversation with anyone is, are these three. The Bible says that will serve you well. Now, to the Pharisees, the idea of plucking the head of the grain off the stalk, that was considered reaping. And taking then the grain, rubbing it in your hands to get to the the edible part, that was considered to be threshing and harvesting. So by interpretation for them, Jesus was doing work on the Sabbath. Now the rabbis had other questionable traditions as well. <laughs> For example, they taught that it was wrong to put to take a little piece of wax. Let's say suddenly you walk into your barn and your wine barrel has a small leak in it. You are not permitted to take a piece of wax and stop up the barrel. That shows that you are unrighteous to do that. That is work and unacceptable. Seems a little far-fetched to me. And then my favorite, if you cut yourself on the Sabbath day, you're not allowed to wipe the wound. Unrighteous. Not acceptable. Now, if you wanted to move a sheaf of wheat on the Sabbath day, well, of course, that clearly seems like work, right? A big old sheaf of wheat, can't pick that up and carry it. That would seem to be more like harvesting. I can go with that. But if you wanted to move the sheaf of wheat, which we could probably all agree was considered work, there's ways. All you've got to do, according to the rabbis, is put a spoon on top of the sheaf of wheat and then if you need to move the spoon, because that's important, you're allowed to move a spoon because that's what you eat with, you want to move the spoon where you want it, then you're allowed to pick up the sheaf with the spoon on top and move it to somewhere else because then you're moving the spoon and not really the sheaf. That's not work. Righteous. Plucking a head of grain on the Sabbath day? <laughs> Never. Verse 3, but he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? You may remember the story of David fleeing from Saul. You can read about that in 1 Samuel 21, and we will soon. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those men who were with him, how he entered the house of of God or the tabernacle and ate the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat nor for those who were with him but only for the priests. Now you may know that every week 12 loaves of presumably unleavened bread, bread of some type, were laid out on a table in the tabernacle. They did that every week. They represented these 12 loaves, the 12 tribes of Israel. They represented how God God's presence was among them and how God's presence was among them back in the wilderness days and provided manna for them. They, he provided everything that they needed. And so these 12 loaves of bread that were set out for show, for testimony of that, show bread, these loaves were replaced once a week to keep them fresh. The priests because they were in the service of God, they're allowed to eat the old ones. When you put the new ones in, you got 12 stale ones, but they're still good. 
you can make a lot of things with stale bread, crumbs. I'm a bread guy. I could eat, I could eat month-old bread probably. I love bread in any form. And so they could still find uses as for it, but they're allowed to because they're the priests and they're in the service of God. So the priests were permitted to eat it. And so David, he's pleading, well... I'm in the service of the Lord because the king has sent me on business, so I'm serving the, king's, the king who is the anointed representative from the Lord, so I'm really doing the service of the Lord. And so Jesus adds here too, and haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple, they profane the Sabbath, meaning don't they work on the Sabbath? And yet... They're blameless? Well, yeah, the Sabbath was a day of rest, no doubt, but not just so you could do things or whatever you want. The Sabbath day was a day of rest. Not, you weren't supposed to be gathering around your TVs and watching football. You weren't supposed to be fishing on the Sabbath day. You weren't supposed to be cooking out with your friends on the Sabbath day. You weren't supposed to be doing all of those things. You are supposed to be focused at least not in an end desire. You're supposed to be focused in your end desire on the Lord and on worshiping the Lord to take a break from all the things of work that week and gather with others and worship the Lord. But of course, priests work on the Sabbath. I... I've tried to make, throughout the years, Sunday a day of rest for my family. It's not a a biblical requirement to to strictly keep that as a no-work day. But I've always taken that as a good principle. And one of my sons teases me that he'll say, Well, Dad, you still work on Sunday. I'm like, well, yeah, I do. I mean, preaching and teaching is work. But the point is, if you're going to do any work on the Sabbath, that's the work you want to do. The work of worship. That's what God calls us to do on this day. So the priests were free to work on the Sabbath day because they're doing the work of worship. And that's the purpose of the Sabbath. So Jesus then seems to be making the point that if the priests and David can eat the bread because they are in the service of the Lord, then the disciples who are eating this bread, can eat. Why? Because they're in the service of the Lord. Wow. Now, in fact, if you could even successfully argue, and you can't, at least not from the scriptures, if you could successfully argue that they were doing work, well, as servants of the Lord, just like the priests, Jesus is saying, they're free to do that work on the Sabbath. There's no problem there. Nothing to see. Move along, people, right? You know. Verse 6, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple, the tabernacle. In other words, he's saying you're, you are so focused on tabernacle rules, temple rules, that you have overlooked the ruler who is standing in front of you. And they had. But verse 7, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guilt less, my disciples. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So the rules of the Pharisees had become really heartless over the years. They had forgotten the words of Micah 6, 8 that some of you may know by heart. What does the Lord require of you? Micah asks, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The Pharisees were so concerned with rules, their man-made rules, that they had lost track of love even for the Lord and love and grace for others. The traditions of men had driven them to fail to recognize their maker standing before them. Now I want to read through Mark's version as well. He doesn't say a whole lot different, but I'll read through it here. Mark 
chapter 2 and verse 23. He reinforces very much what Matthew has said. Now it happened, Mark 2, 23, that Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, His disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to Him, Lord, or excuse me, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? He said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest, so he adds that, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And then Luke 6, 1, to complete all of God's Word on this specific episode in the life of Jesus and the disciples. Luke 6, 1. Now it happened on the second Sabbath, after the first, that He went through the grain fields, and His disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath? But Jesus answering them said, Have you not even read this? What David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he said to them, The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. The worship team can be making their way this morning, and I just want to close with this final faith lesson this morning. It's this. It's so very easy to let the things of worship, the things we do, the colors of things, the times of things, the way we structure things in worship, to become the focus of worship. Heard too many stories over the years where people are fighting about things in the worship service. And they're forgetting to worship the one who they've come to worship. And the Bible, in this illustration of the Pharisees, losing track of that. Here is their maker, and they're stuck on their things. Here is their ruler, and they're stuck on their things. And so we lose track of that. And my charge this morning in clothing, closing is don't let the things of worship interfere with the object of our worship. Our heart must be on the Lord. It must be on that more than anything. If we have lost that, then we have become a show. If we haven't lost that, if we truly are here for the glory of God and to do what we do with that ultimately in our focus, not only on Sundays but throughout the rest of the week, Thank the Lord that we have not lost that. And that's my prayer, that we'll always remember we are here for Him. Not for me, not for any empire that we can build, not for any things that we can do, but ultimately to bring glory to God. That's the message of this passage. He is Lord of Sunday more than we could ever be. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, it is true that you want us here for one purpose. You are the air that we breathe. And you are very great. That's why I'm here. May that always be the reason why I'm here. That's why those gathered here this morning with me are here. May that always be the reason that we are here to bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand this morning as we close out our service? Sing heartily before the Lord. It's about your heart. It's always about your heart.
stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before. Sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh. Bibles this week and maybe we can all meet the Lord in Psalm 104 and remind ourselves how very great he is and then as we close I'm looking at our time and we have about seven or eight minutes before we have a meeting planned at 1030 over in the activity center you might want to make your way there intentionally after you say hello to a few folks uh, worship excuse me the outreach of folk those who are in charge of the drive-through prayer outreach really do want to get some feedback from you as we plan for the future. So if you'd like to participate in that, I know they'd appreciate that. You can be making your way over there at 1030 until about 1045. All right. Brother Wes, would you close us this morning in prayer?